that if, that if natural approaches to health and healing are based upon truth, and they should be able to be supported by uh, good science. The effectiveness or uh, therapeutic benefit of any yeah. substance was it based upon delivering an effective dose. He said that all health begins in the gut. Sometimes with the approval process, it, the, the deck is stacked because uh, the FDA advisory uh, expert panel is composed uh, of consultants uh, to, the, uh, to the drug companies. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, keep it right here listening to the OPP or visit naturalstacks.com. Brian Muncy is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy's an innovator. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Optimal Performance Podcast. Thank you for spending some time with us today, as always, and let's get right into it. Dr. Michael Murray is our guest on the show today. He is a naturopathic doctor, uh, one of the world's leading authorities on natural medicine. He's published over 30 books featuring natural approaches to health. Uh, obviously, that resonates with us, with you. That's why you're here. Dr. Murray is a graduate, former faculty member, and currently serving as a member of the Board of Regents at Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington. He is also the Chief Science Officer at Enzymedica. Dr. Murray is on the OPP today to talk all things digestive health, uh, including why you want to avoid common over-the-counter prescription acid reflux GERD medications known as PPIs or protein pump inhibitors. Uh, we talk about natural ways to support digestion, uh, things like licorice, ginger. We talk about enzymes, probiotics, um, really cool show. Uh, Dr. Murray is also hosting a digestive health summit, and he's going to be talking a little bit about that as well. You guys can sign up for that for free. Go to naturalstacks.com. The blog post for this episode will have links to that summit. Uh, features something like 20 different authorities and experts talking about everything digestive health. So if you are at all interested in optimizing your health, your gut microbiome, any of that stuff, make sure you check that one out. Going to be on the blog at naturalstacks.com. You'll also be able to see links and resources, any of the stuff that uh, the studies that we talk about today. Uh, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show. When we read your review on the air, we will hook you up with a Natural Stacks care package. I want to read a review for you today from Mr. McIntosh. Uh, this is actually an email, but I uh, still wanted to share it with you guys. Great podcast, one of my favorite episodes. A lot that applies to my life personally and professionally as I work with my athletes. Truly appreciate you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Jeff. If what we're doing is helping you, that's fantastic. That's exactly why we're doing it. So please keep the support coming, keep the feedback coming and, you know, continue to share our message and, and what we're doing with the people in your life, whether they be athletes or friends or family, clients, patients, whoever it is, um, you know, that's how we help more people. And that's what this thing is all about. So share the OPP, whether it's this episode or the podcast in general, grab your friend's phones, subscribe them, tell them to start listening share it on social media, whatever you want to do. Uh, we're grateful for your support and uh, anything you can do to help us reach and help more people. That's it for the housekeeping notes. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Murray now. You guys enjoy the show. Thanks for being here. Dr. Michael Murray, welcome to the Optimal Performance Podcast. It's my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, we are honored to have you here. Thanks for joining us today. For our listeners, uh, I think they know this by now. I hate reading people's bios that I find on their websites or Wikipedia page. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a naturopathic physician, a doctor of natural medicine. I'm a graduate and I've served on the 
Board of Trustees and Faculty of Bastyr University in Seattle. And as I was going through my education process in the early 80s, it occurred to me that, that if natural approaches to health and healing are based upon truth, that they should be able to be explained in modern scientific terminology, and they should be able to be supported by uh, good science. And one of the great myths out there is that these natural approaches don't have any science. But the truth is, for most common health conditions, we can build a much a stronger scientific case on the use of diet, lifestyle modifications, uh, attitude adjustments, and the proper use of dietary supplements than we can for many of the drugs that are invoked. So I dedicated my life to collecting information from the medical literature, digesting it, and then putting it out in ways that people can really utilize that information. I've written over 30 books. Uh, including the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine and the Textbook of Natural Medicine. And I've also been instrumental in bringing many safe and effective products to North America, virtually all the standardized herbal extracts from ginkgo, St. John's wort, uh, saw palmetto extract, specialty compounds like quercetin, DGL, curcumin, uh, nutritional compounds like glucosamine sulfate. These are just some of the products that I've helped introduce to North America. And I'm very passionate about helping people uh, explore how they can use nature to uh, improve their health and stay off uh, drugs, which in many times uh, produce more harm than good. All right. This is exactly why I had you tell us your bio, because that's so much more compelling than anything I could have read off of Google. Um, I love what you just said in the very beginning of that. Give us an example of a natural remedy or cure uh, solution that maybe the stereotype in public perception is that it is not backed by science, um, but actually is. <laughs> Gosh, there, there's, so, uh, there's so many examples uh, of this. Um, you know, what popped into my mind first off was ginger. You know, ginger root uh, has been the the subject of over 100 double-blind placebo-controlled studies in all sorts of different applications, in improving digestion, in uh, relieving nausea and vomiting, uh, particularly of pregnancy, of uh, being as effective as uh, uh, some of the motion sickness drugs in, in helping uh, people tolerate uh, motion sickness. It's also been shown to be very effective in relieving pain. Uh, over 100 double-blind studies with ginger uh, in various pain disorders from, uh, from menstrual cramps to arthritis to headaches. Uh, it is really a very effective uh, medicine for, for a wide range of different uh, health conditions. And yet, you know, we just we see it at the store and, and we have uh, no real appreciation for just how powerful this, this simple uh, medicine is. That's really cool. So as you're going through that answer, something that pops into my head as somebody who, I mean, I have experience with Natural Stacks being a supplement company. So I understand sort of, you know, how we, you mentioned earlier, curcumin. I know that's one where uh, it's probably better to take the supplement. It, we know it's better to take the supplement curcumin than it is to try to eat enough turmeric to get the uh, therapeutic dose. With all of these other natural remedies, like something like ginger, is it is it futile to build those into our diet and try to get all of that therapeutic dose from food? Is there a combination, or should we lean more towards getting those beneficial properties from supplements? You know, ginger is a great example. I'm glad I, I'm glad that was the one that popped into my head because. It doesn't really matter what form is. It's a matter of taking the right dosage. And I think that's applicable to any natural compound or any drug for that matter. The effectiveness or uh, therapeutic benefit of any substance, whether it's a food or a drug or a dietary supplement, is based upon delivering an effective dose. And one of the advantages of using extracts or supplements of many herbs in particular is that you're, you're uh, administering, uh, if you're using a standardized product, a consistent dosage where uh, in sometimes in food form, 
you know, it may vary from <laughs> from plant to plant and day to day and uh, in how it's prepared. So uh, there are some advantages to using supplements. But, you know, ginger is a great example because uh, I, I think, you know, having a shot of a fresh ginger juice is a very effective. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, taking most of the research has been just done on dried ginger powder uh, in capsule form. Uh, and that's been shown to be effective. Uh, you have preparations out there where they've concentrated some of the anti-inflammatory properties of, of ginger oil, and those uh, products have been shown to be effective in clinical trials. So uh, we see benefit in a variety of different forms. Uh, you mentioned uh, curcumin, and, and that is another good example. Curcumin is the yellow pigment from turmeric, and uh, as you said, you'd have to ingest uh, just unrealistic amounts of of turmeric in order to get the, the blood levels of curcumin up to a therapeutic range for many of the applications. So uh, in that situation, uh, you're much better off, you know, taking a concentrated form of curcumin as a dietary supplement. All right. So I, I just want to reiterate for our listeners, I mean, I'm a food first person. I, I would be willing to bet that you are too. So I think it's I think it's just a matter of, you know, don't, don't remove those things from your diet just because they won't give you the therapeutic dose, but realize that if you are trying to achieve that therapeutic dose, maybe read the studies, figure out exactly how much you, th you actually need to be getting. And then if you're not getting that through food, get, yeah. the, get the best yeah. supplement to get you there. Absolutely. You know, and uh, my philosophy with, with health and life is all you can do is all you can do. So why not do all that you can do? And so, I like it. I, you know, I, and I, I can just by looking at you, I can tell you follow that same, same philosophy. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that uh, we, we want to uh, have a health promoting lifestyle. We want to eat right. And then we want to support our body's chemistry through proper supplementation. Uh, th these are just things that we can just easily do to significantly improve our health and, and safeguard our health for the future. Well, and let's go from there right into um, one of the reasons that we've got you on the show is we're fascinated and we love the fact that you're putting on this Digestive Health Summit and uh, that will, so we're, we're publishing this episode on August 31st, which is about a week before the event will go live on September 9th. Is that right? The That's right. Through the 17th. Um, we will, uh, we'll send you guys an email about that where you can sign up, but you can, I tell you right now, you can sign up at digestivehealthsummit.com or Dr. M Dr. Murray.com. Um, really fascinating that you guys are putting this on. Uh, you have curated quite a list of experts. Yeah, we have 28 experts and this is a virtual summit and it's free. Uh, uh, it, it, people can, can go to digestive health summit and, and see the, uh, the lineup that we have. Uh, they, they can also uh, just go to my website, drmurray.com and, and get to the, uh, get to the, uh, the summit page as well, uh, but we have we have just a, an all star cast of uh, doctors that are passionate about sharing ways to improve digestive health without the use of drugs. I, I want to uh, quickly, Ryan, just explain why it's so important to to go the natural route when we're looking to improve digestive health. Uh, I think it's a travesty the way that people are being treated these days for common digestive symptoms. Mm -hmm. When people are dealing with gas, bloating, indigestion, heartburn, constipation, and they go see their doctor or their gastroenterologist, they're, they're prescribed any of a number of drugs that end up, in my opinion, causing more harm than good. And I think it's always a good rule to never take a drug that has more symptoms, or should I should say more side effects than you have symptoms. <laughs> right. And you know, one class of drugs that I think is going to be short-lived because uh, the, the data coming out against these drugs because of their side effects is, 
is so damning are the proton pump inhibiting drugs. These are acid blocking drugs like Nexium and Prilosec. And all right, all, well, I, I can't wait to hear all of these damning uh, results that are coming back, but I can't imagine like that that would be a short lived drug. I mean, do you really think that that they would get pulled and that people would stop using them? I mean, they, they seem to be oh, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, I you know we we have we have historical. Uh, uh, examples, uh, you know, many of the cold uh, uh, cough and cold medicines were were yanked uh, when when the the data finally was was so damning that they they had to be taken off. And we've seen countless uh, prescription drugs that that where that has happened as well. And uh, the the data that's coming out, I think that it's it's kind of a house of cards. And when people start understanding what the research is saying and uh, uh, I think I think it's just a matter of time. You know, when will that happen? Will it be five years, ten years, twenty years? I'm not sure, but I think I think that there's going to be many drugs that that are very popular right now that medical historians will look back at and say, "What the heck were those doctors thinking?" Because Look how we view what was done a hundred years ago in medicine with hundred years ago with bloodletting and and uh, administering mercury and other toxins. You know, that was that was the the dominant uh, way of, of treating. Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna have a greater understanding and the evolution of understanding of how our body works. We're uh, shifting towards more natural approaches and it may they just make sense if we look at like an acid blocking drug these proton pump inhibitors they work by uh, blocking enzymes and they block the enzymes that ultimately produce hydrochloric acid well in addition to blocking those enzymes in the body uh, they block other enzymes and uh, for example uh, many of your uh, audience may be familiar with nitric oxide and the benefits that nitric oxide uh, produces in the body and it acts as a vasodilator and very important for blood flow and very important in protecting against clot formation. Well, if what we know about these proton pump inhibitors is that they increase the risk of having a heart attack or stroke. This was based on really groundbreaking evaluation of uh, looking at hospital records and, and uh, the uh, medical records of people that were on proton pump inhibitors and comparing them to people who weren't, and they found a, a striking increased risk for heart attacks and stroke, like a, a two and a half times greater risk. So that led to researchers asking the question, well, how are these drugs impacting the cardiovascular system? And what they found was that they inhibited nitric oxide formation. And, and I'm correct, right? Your audience probably mm -hmm. knows how important that compound is, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So can you imagine, why would you take a drug that's, that's going to block such a vital uh, <laughs> compound? And uh, when you block uh, acid secretion, it leads to a cascade of events because we need that acid to really start the digestive process. And if, if we're not going to be secreting that acid because we're, it's getting blocked, we're going to have many digestive disturbances, nutrient deficiencies, and we're going to alter that intestinal environment. So what they notice when people start using these drugs is that they greatly increase the risk of having a fracture. Uh, they greatly increase the risk of having a gastrointestinal infection, particularly if they're used with antibiotics. Uh, they increase the risk for pneumonia. And they increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, as, as more and more research comes out damning these proton pump inhibitors, people are going to uh, wake up and realize, hey, I, I can't be taking this drug because it's going to shorten my life or make me uh, sick. Uh, and I think there are safe and effective therapies. And what's sad is that the, most of these uh, prescriptions are for people who have really minor issues, uh, a bitter reflux, mm -hmm. uh, heartburn, uh, gas, bloating, indigestion. And these can be, these can be taken care of through uh, a number of different natural approaches. 
Right. And that was going to be sort of my next question is, okay, so let's say I've got my father or, or a 40 year old man or, or woman that has GERD or, or acid reflux and they're on a, a protein pump inhibitor and they hear this information or I tell them, or one of our listeners tells the, you know, their family member, you know, look, this is what it's doing to you. And the person says, okay, well, if I stop, how do I address the symptoms that this drug was there to help me with? Yeah. And the, the, the sad thing is, Ryan, is that uh, uh, there's a rebound uh, of, uh, of, of a person's symptoms when they stop taking uh, these proton pump inhibitors. Right. So they're, perfect you, drugs you, you, for, they're perfect drugs for the, for the drug companies because when people try to get off them, their symptoms come raging back. But right. yes, uh, there are ways that we can deal with, with those symptoms uh, naturally. You know, one of the first things that, that I would recommend uh, with any digestive uh, issue is to l look at uh, a, a high quality digestive enzyme supplement. I'm chief science officer for Enzymedica, and we have a product called Digest Gold, which is by far the most widely used digestive enzyme supplement uh, in North America. Enzymes are molecules that either build other molecules or break them down. Digestive enzymes break down food particles from large uh, particles to smaller particles that our body can then absorb. Many of the symptoms of indigestion, gas, bloating, heartburn, etc., are caused by not breaking food down properly. So one simple experiment is a trial of using our Digest Gold with every meal for 14 days. Uh, we like to see people do that because it's it's the, the kind of with the digestive uh, patient the 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 product is either going to help them or not. And you can't fool the digestive uh, patient. Uh, they know how food affects them. They know what's, how uh, things benefit them or hurt them. Uh, and uh, they want immediate relief. And if you break down food better, uh, a lot of these symptoms just go away. So that's just one, one simple recommendation. We talk a lot about GERD. We talk a lot about other digestive uh, issues at the Digestive Health Summit. And again, that's my, you know, my, my purpose uh, right now is to really promote this uh, Digestive Health Summit so people become aware of some of these wonderful natural approaches to improving digestive health. And uh, one of the great uh, quotes of all time comes from uh, Hippocrates. He said that all health begins in the gut. Uh, and uh, so digestion is really kind of the centerpiece of, of improving our health and, and, and uh, maintaining our health and, and restoring our health. So uh, this uh, Digestive Health Summit has uh, information for, for everybody. We have 28 uh, experts. Some of my favorite uh, doctors of all time are on this summit. Uh, Dr. Bill Sears is the pediatrician of our era, and uh, he is, is offering five tips for, for good gut health. And he is, he's a, the premier pediatrician of our generation, as I said, and he puts, he, he puts things in such simple terms because he's used to talking to mothers about their children. And, and uh, I, I love that interview. Uh, these interviews last anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes and, and uh, they're, they're full of uh, uh, great insights on how you can improve your digestive health. And we, we have many different, uh, uh, speakers because they have many different areas of focus and, and insights. So uh, again, people can go to digestivehealthsummit.com or my website, drmurray.com and get more information. You mentioned that digestive enzymes are crucial for breaking down food, assimilating nutrients, getting everything out of the food that, you know, we are eating it for. How do digestive enzymes compare with probiotics? That's a great question. Uh, you know, probiotics have become very familiar to a lot of people, and uh, they don't uh, always uh, have realistic expectations. Probiotics are very important in supporting digestive health. They refer to uh, health-promoting bacteria. Uh, they don't really help digest food, but they're very important for maintaining what's called the microbiome, the collection of bacteria and other organisms in our gut. And uh, there's a lot of great science on the benefits of, 
of uh, probiotic supplementation and helping with uh, a number of gastrointestinal issues, uh, primarily uh, antibiotic-induced diarrhea or severe alterations in, in gut flora. But uh, the probiotics are limited in some of the, the, the real issues that people are having with their digestive health, such as, again, gas, bloating, and indigestion. Uh, enzymes are much more effective because they actually help break down uh, food particles into smaller molecules. And a lot of times people have intolerances to food because they lack certain enzymes. For example, most people are probably familiar with being lactose intolerant. That's when you are intolerant to milk and dairy because it contains a sugar called lactose. And uh, some people don't make enough of the enzyme lactase, which can break it down. But you can uh, take lactase as a supplement and uh, really uh, effectively break down that lactose so that uh, people can, can tolerate that, uh, that, that food. Um, it, it's, it's really uh, you know, a, a simple uh, explanation on how uh, enzymes can be used in, in helping people with food intolerances. Uh, for example, uh, um, sometimes people are really uh, having trouble with even eating vegetables because of some of the, uh, the fibers and, and polysaccharides that are in vegetables causing a lot of, of gas. Well, uh, there are specialty enzyme formulas that can help uh, break down those those uh, those sugar molecules and uh, allow those foods to be to be better tolerated. So uh, the company that I work with, Enzymetica, we make a variety of foods based upon, uh, or excuse me, a variety of products based upon helping people with specific uh, food intolerances. And it's really interesting when you, when you uh, start looking at uh, food intolerances because uh, I think that's a big cause of, of uh, a lot of people's digestive uh, complaints. Uh, gluten's been vilified, uh, and many people are intolerant to gluten, uh, and they may benefit by, by taking uh, a product like our product, the Glutenese, which contains a, s a special enzyme, which can help break down gluten and allow people to tolerate it. And I think food intolerances is a very underappreciated or overlooked element of health. Uh, that's we, We've had um, pinner test scientists were on the show previously to, to talk about, you know, how we can identify food intolerances. And, you know, when we talked with their chief science officer, he was explaining to us how, you know, eating offending foods increases gut inflammation and that, you know, creates this negative spiral that uh, if you have inflammation, you're not getting the production of certain neurotransmitters and that will affect uh, specifically serotonin. That's going to affect mood. It also impacts carbohydrate cravings uh, and, and people will have uh, higher stress levels. They'll want more carbs and that cycle sort of perpetuates. And then, you know, if you continue to eat offending foods or if you don't get rid of that inflammation um, it just builds and cycles and, and it's a very hard thing to to break and get out of especially if you're not identifying those offending foods yeah, absolutely and uh, again like Hippocrates says all health begins in the gut and uh, it, it, if we look at what they do to baby food or infant formulas we can see the value of, of enzymes for food intolerances uh, when when a baby is intolerant to formula, they have to be switched to a hypoallergenic formula. Now, if you look at what's the difference between a hypoallergenic infant formula versus a, a regular one, the difference is, is that the, the proteins have been uh, digested, partially digested <laughs> by enzymes. And, uh, that process can happen when we take enzymes is a dietary supplement. We're just assisting the body's ability to digest protein. That's so, bringing yeah, in formulas. So, and, yeah. So, are those formulas they're they're giving like di and tripeptides things that are uh, shorter than the full protein chain? 
a little bit larger than than the, the dye and try, but definitely shorter. And, and the more hydrolyzed and more broken down, the more hypoallergenic these these proteins are. So why is that not the default for formula? <laughs> well, I, I think it is for uh, <laughs> for a lot of kids. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it basically uh, uh, the reason it's not the default is that. Uh, most kids are able to to digest those proteins just just like you know most most adults should be able should be able to uh, digest the, the food that they eat but uh, as we age uh, we our, our uh, ability to secrete uh, f- efficient uh, levels of enzymes is reduced and then sometimes our diet is such that we require some additional support for for example uh, a lot of uh, bodybuilders and, and athletes are consuming very large amounts of protein, and they may exhaust or uh, have higher needs for uh, digestive enzymes. And so supplementing uh, their, their meals with digestive enzymes can really help them tremendously. Uh, it's, uh, I know... I know <laughs> I've had uh, many patients that uh, uh, you know benefited by uh, uh, these this simple measure of just you know using uh, digestive enzymes to help them break their food down better, and then uh, that allows them to to feel better and, and and not be bothered by gas, bloating, or indigestion. Right. I want to circle back. You were, we were talking earlier about. Um, these protein pump inhibitors potentially being pulled. Um, there's precedent for drugs previously being pulled when research comes out that you know shows how harmful they are. I can't help but but wonder how they got approved in the first place. What does that say about the approval process? Well, a lot of the times with drugs, you you don't really uh, know. Uh, what the uh, real effect is going to be in a very large uh, population group. Uh, when they do these studies, uh, they're, they're to get approval, uh, well, they're usually done by clinical research organizations that are paid by the drug companies. And there's the whole... So there's, stuff, there's, there's a conflict of interest from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, there's a conflict of interest. And, and then the uh, sometimes with the approval process, it, the, the deck is stacked because uh, the FDA advisory uh, expert panel is composed of uh, basically uh, consultants to the, uh, to the drug companies. So sometimes it, we, 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 we see that... Uh, there were problems with these drugs from the very be- very beginning, and there had been many cases of that uh, re- reported over the years. With the proton pump inhibitors, uh, they're they're problematic uh, right now. They're uh, they're available over the counter. Uh, other acid blocking drugs are available over the counter, and uh, they're just they're they're being overused, uh, and people are being uh, basically uh, coerced into taking them for uh, benefits that, that aren't there. Uh, I, I really think that uh, when, when uh, the story is, is told on these proton pump inhibitors uh, completely, that, that they'll be judged as being a, a very bad bad drug. It's kind of like, did you ever see the movie Jer- The Jerk? You might be too young. Mm-hmm. For that, uh, Steve Martin, right? Yeah, yeah Steve Martin. So he, he, he developed uh, that, that little contraption so that glasses wouldn't fall down a, a person's nose. And uh, he, he became a millionaire and big success. And then uh, he, he uh, lost it all because people started going uh, cross-eyed. Uh, so, uh, you know, sometimes we don't know the long-term side effects until they're out in the market for, for quite some time. Uh, th- I think that's, that's the real case with these PPIs. Okay. Um, so let's, let's talk about how the gut impacts brain function, um, particularly things like our emotions, feelings, decision-making. Yeah. Uh, it, it's often referred to as the, the, the second brain. Uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, interesting. There are more neurotransmitters, brain chemicals produced in the gut than there is in the brain. And there's this 
this uh, very close connection between our gut and our brain. And a lot of that is, is mediated or controlled by the microbiome. I mentioned that earlier. And that's a really interesting field of study where they're looking at how uh, the, the gut bacteria influence our mood and our ability to think. Uh, they did a really interesting study a few years back they were looking at the influence of a probiotic supplement in reducing allergy symptoms. And uh, they did the study and they found that the kids that received the probiotic uh, had a fewer uh, cases of asthma and eczema compared to the group that got the placebo. And they only took the supplements the first six months of life. They, they kept following up this group because uh, they started seeing some really interesting findings. Not only was there a lower rate of asthma and eczema in this group, when they got of school age, they found that they uh, had fewer days of school missed compared to those that were in the placebo group. And then when they got to be around 12 and, and 13, the researchers really started noticing something. And uh, they brought all the kids back in to be evaluated for, uh, for autism and uh, Asperger's syndrome. And what they found was that the, in the kids that got the probiotic, there was not a single case of autism or Asperger's uh, disease or syndrome uh, that occurred. And uh, that has to be done on a larger scale and, and, and all, but the takeaway message is that uh, a lot of these issues that, uh, that are so prevalent in this day and age, uh, autism, attention deficit disorder, depression, uh, they all may be related to uh, uh, our gut and in particular, uh, the microbiome. Well, we know that's our, our first line of defense. That's a huge part of our immune system. So yeah. by providing a massive amount of support in the form of probiotics that early in life, it would stand to, to reason that, you know, you're, you're supporting the body's ability to, I guess, fend off, um, some of those, some of those sounded like immune, uh, autoimmune disorders, like especially yeah. eczema, but, but still, um, I mean, and even one of the claims with autism is that, you know, that the, if the shots are given, um, in triplicate with the with the MMR on schedule, that sometimes it's too big of a toxin dose too early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that uh, that that we're we're learning about this relationship between the gut uh, bacteria and our overall health, and you know that's why probiotics are such a big uh, uh, focus these days. Uh, but I, I think that uh, we need to also focus on other natural. Uh, digestive aids. We, I talked a lot about uh, enzymes uh, today, but there are, you know, obviously some herbal approaches and nutritional approaches that are very useful in, in helping to improve digestive health. Yeah. What would be a few of your favorite herbs? Well, <laughs> uh, I mentioned ginger uh, earlier. I also like, uh, I, I like uh, uh, deglycerizinated licorice. Uh, it's abbreviated DGL. Uh, I, I like to re say that it represents darn good licorice. And, uh, this uh, uh, natural product has been shown to be very useful in, in helping to relieve uh, ulcers and, uh, and reflux. And, uh, um, it's got good science behind it and, and uh, it's, it's very safe. Uh, it's produced by removing a compound from licorice that can cause high blood pressure in some people. And what, what's interesting about that, Ryan, is that the compound, what, what happened was is they Licorice has long been used for uh, ulcers historically. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, so they isolated what they thought was the active constituent that was responsible for that benefit, and, and this glycerotinic acid. And they, it was actually the first substance shown to be effective in the treatment of ulcers in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Well, the problem was is that many people started having uh, elevations in their blood pressure. So the researchers asked the question, what about the stuff that we used to throw away? <laughs> so what they found was is the stuff that they used to throw away turned out to be a better anti-ulcer medication than 
uh, the glycerotinic acid. So uh, I, I love DGL. I think it's a very useful and effective uh, natural product for digestion. That's really cool. Uh, any other herbs? Oh yeah, you know, I mean, we could we could uh, talk talk for hours. I mean, uh, even something as simple as uh, you know peppermint tea or taking enteric coated peppermint oil capsules. Peppermint is great. Uh, for irritable bowel syndrome, it's uh, it's an antispasmodic. Sometimes uh, you know people uh, have to avoid like those peppermint mints after dinner because it could, could lead to a reflux. But uh, a little bit of peppermint tea, or better yet, uh, taking enteric coated uh, peppermint oil. That's where the oil is in a capsule that is resistant to breaking down in the stomach and is allowed to get into the small intestine, and then there it will help. Uh, relieve uh, intestinal spasm as well as exert some some uh, beneficial antimicrobial effects. Uh, so many uh, natural products to talk about with with digestive health. And again, I'll give a plug for the the Digestive Health Summit. Uh, try and try and uh, uh, sign up for that. It's free. Um, uh, I think you know. Again, uh, the key to our health starts with good digestive health, and uh, uh, that's why this this summit's so important. So, is there another uh, approach to improving digestive health naturally that we haven't talked about? Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've we've just only uh, not even scratched the surface. The key points that I, I really wanted to get across today is that there are serious problems with uh, some of the conventional treatments of uh, these, uh, you know, common digestive complaints. And there are safe and effective natural approaches. And, and if people are interested, uh, they can go to my website. They can also go uh, to the digestedhealthsummit.com and, uh, and, and be a participant in this, uh, in, in this uh, revolutionary summit where we're really highlighting these natural approaches to deal with uh, not only these common digestive issues, but uh, some of the more uh, uh, you know, special things that are kind of getting some notoriety these days, such as uh, SIBO, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, we also touch on the, some of the inflammatory conditions that affect the uh, digestive tract and also uh, the, you know, the way in which certain health conditions uh, are linked to a poor digestive health, such as diabetes, which is uh, an epidemic. Yeah, talk about how diabetes, which is, you know, in most people's mind, it's, it's a blood sugar and an insulin issue. How is that linked to gut health? Yeah. It, it, what's, what's interesting about diabetics is they, they have dysfunction in just about every body system. And what, what happens when a person has a, a, a diabetes is that it, it leads to complete disruption of feedback mechanisms and, and, and uh, control of the way our body works. And, and uh, they historically have uh, issues with with uh, d digestion, uh, uh, simple things like gas, bloating, and, and constipation. Uh, but these can be addressed, uh, and we see benefit uh, in, in improving blood sugar control uh, in a, a person's uh, digestive health if they have diabetes. So uh, the, the two kind of go hand in hand. But with with the diabetic, the the, the, the focus should always be on how we can improve uh, that blood sugar control. All right, Dr. Murray, if you had to give listeners two or three tips, your, your two or three best things, or, or if, if people could only focus on these two or three things to improve their digestive health, what should they direct their focus and attention and energy towards? Well, first one I would say is, is be mindful. Uh, and, and what that means is uh, uh, pay attention uh, to the process of eating, making sure you're, you're relaxed and, and, uh, and thoroughly chewing your food and, and really being mindful of the, the benefits that it's providing. And also being mindful to look to see how your body's reacting. Uh, is it causing any discomfort, any gas or bloating? Uh, you know how how are your your bowel movements? Uh, just becoming more aware and mindful of your digestion that that would be that would be my number one biggest uh, recommendation. 
Okay. Uh, is there a second one? Yeah, uh, I, I think just, you know, focus on, on uh, quality of food. A lot of times people have digestive <laughs> issues because they're eating junk. Right. So if you're eating junk, you are going to have digestive issues. So, uh, <laughs> you know, being mindful is also being mindful of what you're eating and making sure that it, it's, uh, it's a health-promoting food. I will second that one. <laughs> Dr. Murray, we, we mentioned it a few times, but tell our listeners where they can get more of you. Uh, they can get more of me by going to drmurray.com, and that's D-O-C-T-O-R-M-U-R-R-A-Y.com or drmurray.com, drmurray.com. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned quite a few books in your uh, repertoire. Uh, are those available on the site, Amazon? Yeah, both. Uh, people okay. can go to my site, and then uh, uh, they can they can click on the books tab and see the books that I've written uh, and I've got a new book that'll be out in in October called the uh, The Magic of Food, and maybe I can come back and talk about that. Oh, that would be a, a blast! Cool. Let's do that. Um, before we let you go, we want to know your top three tips to live optimal, and they don't have to be all about digestive health. Yeah, I think the first one is to uh, live in a state of uh, of gratitude. I'm primarily a medical researcher, and I read all this great information and, and try to disseminate it to people in a way that they can understand. So I, I come across some really interesting studies, and uh, one study looked at trying to create a hierarchy of importance of uh, various diet, lifestyle, and psychological factors in determining a person's ability to live a long, healthy, and happy life. And uh, when they sifted through all the data, the, the trait that stood out the most was the expression of appreciation and gratitude. There's something about saying thank you and acknowledging people and, and just living in that state of grace that really promotes longevity. So that would be my number one. Uh, number, number two is uh, uh, just, again, all you can do is all you can do. So why not do all you can do? And so you know, uh, don't underestimate the importance of every little thing because uh, it, it's all part of the the puzzle, and uh, it's like a it's like a, a finely tuned uh, machine. Uh, you know, what pick your favorite car, a Ferrari or Lamborghini, or whatever. Uh, every part, every piece, every component of that car is critical to the functioning of that car, and that same. Uh, analogy is true within us. And so we need to have a positive mental attitude. We need to have a good uh, health promoting lifestyle, getting enough sleep, exercising, staying away from things that can do us harm. And we need to eat well and we need to support our body through uh, proper nutritional supplementation. And then we need body work. Uh, so, you know, that I think I. I'm, I guess I, I, I'm, a, I'm a zealot, uh, an extremist, but, um, you know, uh, you're only given this one body and uh, this one life, so why not, why not go for it and really take care of it? And it's sad for me to listen to my, you know, friends on the, on the T-Box talk about their aches and pains or seeing people suffering from, from poor health when they have the ability to take their health in their own hands and really make a difference in their lives. And uh, it's, it's a fabulous path, the path to health. Hmm. That's well said. Dr. Murray, thanks for being here on the OPP today. And uh, for you guys listening, go to naturalstacks.com. We'll have the show notes links to studies and links to the Digestive Health Summit as well. Uh, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. When we read your review on the air, we will get you a Natural Stacks care package as a thank you. And as always, share the OPP. This episode and the show itself, that's how we reach new people and, and reach more people. That's how we help as many people as possible so that they can get on this journey that Dr. Murray so eloquently described just now. Um, I think that's it. Dr. Murray, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Yeah, I can't wait. Let me, I'm going to, let's see, stop.